Hey guys, so today's video is going to be on the Commerce, the Committee of Commerce from the United States Senate. The United States did an investigation into the Titanic disaster and they came up with their own report. Um, I recently did a video showing you guys some documents from the era and there was a report in there on a committee of the uh, Committee of Commerce, but it was like really condensed and it was bits and pieces taken from it. It was a digested version. So I went to the website, the government website, right to the Committee of Congress, and I put it in the search engine and it came up. So I have the official report that I wanna share with you guys, and this is too good not to share. So I hope you enjoy the video. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna break it down into categories and I'll let you know the findings. Senate Committee on Commerce, Subcommittee on the Titanic Disaster. When the luxury liner Titanic sank in the North Atlantic on April 15, 1912, with more than 1,500 lives lost, the world was stunned. How could such a disaster happen in the modern era of unsinkable ships? To answer that question, Senator William Olin Smith of Michigan chaired a special subcommittee on the Senate Commerce Committee that held hearings within days of the disaster. The hearings began on April 19, 1912 at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York City. The next week, the hearings were moved to the Cactus Room of the new Senate Office Building in Washington, D.C. They were the first hearings to be held in that room. A total of 82 witnesses testified about ice warnings that were ignored, the inadequate number of lifeboats, the ship speed, the failure of nearby ships to respond to Titanic's distress calls, and the treatment of passengers of different classes. The hearings concluded on May 25, 1912, when Senator Smith visited the Titanic sister ship Olympic at port in New York to interview some of its crew. The subcommittee hearing transcripts issued as Senate Document 726, 62nd Congress, second session, and published in 1912, over 1,100 pages long. The subcommittee's final report issued on May 28, 1912 stated, the committee finds that this accident clearly indicates the necessity of additional legislation to secure safety of life at sea. The committee made numerous recommendations, including revisions of statutes to require lifeboat capacity for every passenger, proper assignment and training of crew members, lifeboat assignments, and drills for passengers before departure, regulation of radio telegraphy and safety improvements to ocean-going passenger steamships. The investigation led to significant reforms in international maritime safety to address those concerns. They were addressed as well to the creation of the International Ice Patrol, a branch of the U.S. Coast Guard that patrols the Atlantic and Arctic oceans for icebergs. This resolution was passed on April 17, 1912. The hearings held were from April 19th to May 25th of 1912, and their final report was issued on May 28th of 1912. The chairman was William A. Smith, Republican from Michigan. The committee members were George C. Perkins, Republican from California, Jonathan Bourne Jr., Republican from Oregon, Theodore E. Burton, Republican from Ohio, F. M. Simmons, a Democrat from North Carolina, Francis G. Newlands, a Democrat from Nevada, and Duncan U. Fletcher, a Democrat from Florida. Investigation into the loss of SS Titanic. Released May 28, 1912. Ordered to be printed. Mr. Smith of Michigan from the Committee of Commerce submitted the following report. Pursuant to SRES 283. The Committee of Commerce wished to authorize a directed to inquire to the loss of British steamship Titanic. 
respectfully reports that the duty has been performed and the committee has reached its conclusion thereon. The resolution is as follows. Resolved that the Committee on Commerce of the Subcommittee thereof is hereby authorized and directed to investigate the cause leading to the wreck of the White Star Line, Titanic, with its additional loss of life so shocking to the civilized world. Resolved further that said committee and subcommittee thereof is hereby empowered to summon witnesses, send for persons and papers, to administer oaths and to take such testimony as much may be necessary to determine the responsibility, therefore, with a view to such legislation as may be necessary to prevent as far as possible any repetition of such a disaster. Resolved further is that the committee shall inquire particularly into the number of lifeboats, life rafts, and life preservers, and other equipment for the protection of the passengers and the crew, the number of persons aboard Titanic, whether passenger or crew, and whether adequate inspections were made of such vessel. In view of the large number of American passengers traveling on route commonly regarded as the dangerous from icebergs, and whether it is feasible for Congress to take steps looking to an international agreement to secure the protection of sea traffic, including regulation of the size of ships and designation of routes. Resolved further that the report of said committee, it shall recommend such legislation as it shall deem expedient and the expenses incurred by this investigation shall be paid from the contingent fund of the Senate upon vouchers to be approved by the chairman of said committee. Attest, Charles G. Bennett, Secretary, by H. M. Rose, Assistant Secretary. According to the following senators were appointed as members of the subcommittee, William Alden Smith, Michigan Chairman, George C. Perkins, California, Jonathan Bourne, Jr., Oregon, T Theodore E. Burton, Ohio, F. M. Simmons, North Carolina, Francis G. Newlands, Nevada, and Duncan U. Fletcher of Florida. Witnesses examined. We examine 82 witnesses upon various phases of this catastrophe, including the examination of 53 British subjects or residents of Great Britain and 29 citizens of the United States or residents thereof. We interrogated two general officers of the International Mercantile Marine Company, which owned the steamship Titanic, J. Bruce Ismay of Liverpool, England, President, also a passenger on the ship of this voyage, and P.A.S. Franklin of New York, Vice President in the United States of the International Mercantile Marine Company. All the surviving officers, four in number, Charles Herbert Lighttower, second officer of Netley Abbey, Hampshire, England, third officer, Herbert John Pittman of Somerset, England, fourth officer, Joseph Grawls Boxhall of Hull, England, and fifth officer, Harold Godfrey Lowe of North Wales, and 34 members of the crew whose names are as follows. C.E. Andrews, Assistant Steward, 145 Millbrook Road, Southampton. Archer Ernest, Seaman, 59 Porchester Road, Southampton. Frederick Barrett, Leading Fireman, Southampton. Seaman W. Bryce, 11 Lower Canal Wall, Southampton. H. S. Bride, Telegrapher, London, England. A. J. Bright, Quartermaster, 105 Firgrove Road, Southampton. E. J. Bewley, Seaman, 10 Cliff Road, Woolley, Southampton. W. Burke, Saloon Steward, 57 Bridge Road, Southampton. F. Clench, Seaman, 10 The Flats, Chantry Road, Southampton. J. Collins, Assistant Cook, 65 Bali Carry, Belfast. A. Crawford, 
Bedroom Steward, 22 Cranberry Avenue, Southampton. G.F. Crow, Steward, 89 Milton Road, Southampton. A. Cunningham, Bedroom Steward, 60 Charlton Road, Southampton. F. O. Evans, Seaman, 14 Bond Street, Southampton. H. S. Etches, Bedroom Steward, 23A Gordon Avenue, Southampton. F. Fleet, Lookout, Sailor, Number 9 Norman Road, Southampton. Albert Haynes, Boatswain's Mate, Number 52 Groves Street, Southampton. Hardy J. Stewart, Oakland Hollywood Avenue, Highland, Southampton. Samuel S. Hemmings, Trimmer, Lamp Trimmer, 31 Kingsley Road, Southampton. Robert Hitchens, Quartermaster, 43 James Street, Southampton. G.A. Hogg, Lookout, Sailor, 44 High Street, Southampton. Thomas Jones, Seaman, 68 Westfield, Liverpool. G. Moore, Seaman, 51 Graham Road, Southampton. A. Oliver, Quartermaster, 38 Anderson Road, Southampton. F. Osman, Seaman, 43 High Street, Itchen, Southampton. W. A. Perkins, Quartermaster, Victoria Road, Bitterine, Southampton. H. J. Pittman, 3rd Officer, Castle Carry, Somerset, Southampton. F. D. Ray, Saloon Steward, Palmer Park Avenue, Reading. G. T. Rowe, Quartermaster, 63 Henry Street, Gosport. G. Simmons, Lookout, Sailor, 55 Franchise Street, Weymouth. W. H. Taylor, Fireman, Number 2 Broad Street, Southampton. W. Ward, Saloon, Steward, 107 Millbrook Road, Southampton. E. Wheelton, Saloon Steward, Norwood House, Shirley, Southampton. J. Widgery, Baths, 25 Rokeby Avenue, Redland, Bristol. We took the testimony of 21 passengers of all classes, including President Ismay, and the 23 other witnesses on subjects related to our inquiry, including Vice President Franklin. We held our session, sessions in New York and in Washington and took testimony by deposition in other parts of the country and in the Dominion of Canada. The results of the investigation may be stated. Ownership of Steamship Titanic We find that the Titanic was a White Star steamer and was owned by the Oceanic Steam Navigation Company of England and the stock of which company is in turn owned by the International Navigation Company Limited of England and the stock of that company in turn is owned by the International Mercantile Marine Company an American corporation organized under the laws of New Jersey. International Mercantile Marine Company. Mr. J. Bruce Ismay of Liverpool, England is president of the International Mercantile Marine Company. And Mr. P. A. S. Franklin of New York City is vice president of that company in the United States. The board of directors of the International Mercantile Marine Company is composed of the following persons. C. A. Griscom, chairman. E. C. Grenfell, John F. Archbold, John I. Waterbury, the Right Honorable Lord Peary, George W. Perkins, Charles Steele, J. Bruce Ismay, President, Percy Chubb, E. J. Berwind, Harold A. Sanderson, P. A. B. Widener, Charles F. Torrey, J. P. Morgan, Jr. The International Mercantile Marine Company, through its various ramifications, 
and Constituent Companies owns the White Star Line, the American Line, the Red Star Line, the Atlantic Transport Line, the National Line, and the majority of the stock of the Leland Line. This company is capitalized as follows in round numbers. $102 million between the preferred and common shares. $52 million of 4.5% bonds. $19 million about 5% bonds. And $7 million about of underlying bonds. The total stock and bonded liability is about $180 million. This company owns and operates a fleet of about 125 vessels with a total of about 1,550,000 tons register, doing a general transoceanic transportation business throughout the world. General Particulars of Steamship Titanic the Titanic was built by Harlan and Wolfe of Belfast, Ireland. No restriction as to limit of cost was placed upon the builders. She was launched May 31, 1911. She was a vessel of 46,328 tons, register. Her length was 882.6 feet and her breadth was 92.6 feet. Her boat deck and her bridge were 70 feet above the waterline. She was, according to the testimony of President Ismay, especially constructed to float with her two largest watertight compartments full of water. The vessel, fully equipped, cost 1.5 million pounds sterling, or about $7,500,000. At the time of the accident, the vessel carried insurance of 1 million pounds sterling, or about $5 million the remaining risk being carried by the company's insurance fund. The Titanic was a duplicate of the Olympic, which is owned by the same company, with the single exception of her passenger accommodations, and was built to accommodate 2,599 passengers, with additional accommodations for officers and crew, numbering 903 persons. Trial Tests for Steamship Titanic the committee finds that the evidence that between six and seven hours was spent in making trial tests of this vessel at Belfast low on Monday, the first day of April last. A few turning circles were made, compasses adjusted, and she steamed a short time under approximately a full head of steam, but the ship was not driven at her full speed. One general officer of the steamship company was on board during the trial tests while the builders were represented by Mr. Thomas Andrews, who had superintended the building of the vessel. Mr. Andrews conducted certain tests at Southampton and represented the builders both at Southampton and on the first voyage. With a partial crew, the ship sailed from Belfast immediately after the trial for Southampton, where she arrived on Wednesday, April 3rd, about midnight. She made fast with her port side to the wharf, where she remained until April 10th, about 12 o'clock noon, when she sailed for Cherbourg, Queenstown, and New York. Only two lifeboats lowered. Many of the crew did not join the ship until a few hours before sailing, and the only drill while a vessel lay in Southampton on the voyage consisted in lowering two lifeboats on the starboard side into the water which boats again hoisted up to the boat deck within half an hour. No boat list designated the stations or members of the crew was posted until several days after sailing from Southampton, boatmen being left in ignorance of their proper stations until the following Friday morning. Certificate of British Board of Trade. On Wednesday morning, the day the ship sailed from Southampton, Captain Clark, a representative of the British Board of Trade, came aboard and after spending a brief time issued the necessary certificate to permit sailing. Boat Davits and Lifeboats of the Steamship Titanic The Titanic was fitted with 16 sets of double-acting boat davits of modern type, capable of handling two or three boats per set of davits, the davits were thus capable of handling 48 boats, 
whereas the ship carried but 16 lifeboats and four collapsibles, fulfilling all the requirements of the British Board of Trade. The Titanic was provided with 14 lifeboats, of capacity for 65 persons each, or 910 persons. Two emergency sea boats, of capacity for 35 persons each, or 70 persons and four collapsible boats of capacity for 49 persons each or 196 persons. Total lifeboat capacity 1,176. There was ample life belt equipment for all. Departure of the steamship Titanic. The ship left Southampton Wednesday, April 10th at 12.15 p.m. with the ship's complement of officers and crew numbering 899 persons. As the Titanic left the wharf at Southampton, the moorings of the New York were carried away by the backlash from the Titanic's starboard propeller, causing a delay of about half an hour. Passenger list and survivors of steamship Titanic. The Titanic arrived at Cherbourg late in the same afternoon. The Titanic left Cherbourg and proceeded to Queenstown, Ireland, arriving there on Thursday, about midday. Departing for New York immediately after, embarking the mails and passengers. Her passenger list was made up of the following. First class passengers who sailed on a Titanic. 156 women and children and 173 men making a total of 329 first class passengers survivors women and children 145 and men 54 leaving a total of 199 survivors from first class the first class passengers that were lost were women and children 11 and 119 men for a total of 130 passengers from first class that were lost. The second class passengers who sailed on Titanic, there were 128 women and children and 157 men, bringing it to a total of 285. The second class passengers that survived were 104 women and children and 15 men. A total of survivors were 119. The second class passengers that were lost were among the women and children, they were 24, and they were 142 men lost from second class, bringing a total of 166 members of the second class passengers to be lost. Third class passengers who sailed on a Titanic there were 224 women and children, and there were 486 men, bringing it to a total of 710. The third class passenger survivors were 105 women and children and 69 men, bringing it to a total of 174. Third class passengers that were lost were 119 women and children and 417 men, bringing it to a total of 536 third-class passengers that were lost. To summarize, the passengers and survivors, including the crew, the Titanic sailed with 2,223 persons aboard, of whom 1,517 were lost, and 706 were saved. It will be noted that this connection there is 60% of the first class passengers were saved, 42% of the second class passengers were saved, and 25% of the third class passengers were saved, and 24% of the crew were also saved. Weather conditions during the voyage. During the entire voyage, the weather was clear, with a single exception of 10 minutes of fog, and the sea was calm throughout the voyage, with sunshine the whole of each day and bright starlight every night. 
Greetings were frequently exchanged with passing vessels by appropriate signals. Ice warnings. On the third day out, ice warnings were received by the wireless operators of the Titanic, and a testimony is conclusive that at least three of these warnings came direct to the commander of the Titanic on the day of the accident. The first about noon from the Baltic of the White Star Line. It will be noted that this message places icebergs within five miles of the track which Titanic was following. And near the place where the accident occurred, the message from the commander of the Baltic is as follows. Captain Smith, Titanic, have had moderate variable winds and clear fine weather since leaving. Greek steamer, Athenas reports passing icebergs in large quantity of field ice today in latitude 41.51 north by longitude 49.52 west. Last night we spoke German oil tanker Deutschland, Stetten to Philadelphia, not under control, short of coal, latitude 40.42 degrees north by longitude 55.11 degrees Wishes to be reported to New York and other steamers. Wish you and Titanic all success. A second message was received by the Titanic from the Californian of the Leland Line at 5.35 p.m. New York time, Sunday afternoon, reporting ice about 19 miles to northward of the track of the Titanic was following. This message was as follows. Latitude 42.3 north, longitude 49.9 west, three large bergs five miles to southward of us, regards, Sig Lord. The third message was transmitted from the America via the Titanic in Cape Race to the Hydrographic Office in Washington, D.C., reporting ice about 19 miles to the southward of the course being followed by the Titanic and reads as follows. Steamship America via Titanic in Cape Race, NF. Hydrographic Office, Washington, DC. America passed two large icebergs in 41.27 north by 50.8 west on the 14th of April. This message was actually received at the Hydrographic Office in Washington at 10.51 p.m. on April 14th. The fourth message was sent to the Titanic at 9.05 p.m. New York time on Sunday, the 14th of April, approximately an hour before the accident occurred. The message reads as follows. We are stopped and surrounded by ice. To this operator, the Titanic replied, shut up, I am busy. I am working in Cape Race. While this was the last message sent by the Californian to the Titanic, the evidence shows that the operator of the Californian kept the telephones on his head and heard the Titanic talking to Cape Race up to within a few minutes of the time of the accident. When he put the phones down, he took off his clothes and turned in. The Baltics operator on that Sunday overheard ice reports going to the Titanic from the prime Frederick Wilhelm and from the America while the Carpathia on the same day overheard the Parisian talking about ice with other ships. This enables the committee to say that the ice positions so definitely reported to the Titanic just preceding the accident located ice on both sides of the track or lane which Titanic was following. In her immediate vicinity, no general discussion took place among the officers. No conference was called to consider these warnings. No heed was given to them. The speed was not relaxed, the lookout was not increased, and the only vigilance displayed by the officer of the watch was by instructions to the lookout to keep a sharp lookout for ice. Speed. The speed of the Titanic was gradually increased after leaving Queenstown. The first day's run was 464 miles. The second day's run was 519 miles. The third day's run was 546 miles. 
Just prior to the collision, the ship was making her maximum speed of the voyage, not less than 21 knots or 24 and a half miles per hour. The collision. At 11.46 p.m. ship's time, or 10.30 p.m. New York's time, Sunday evening on April 14th, the lookout signaled the bridge and telephoned the officer of the watch, Iceberg right ahead. The officer of the watch, Mr. Murdoch, immediately ordered the quartermaster at the wheel to put the helm hard a starboard and reverse the engines. But while the sixth officer standing behind the quartermaster at the wheel reported to Officer Murdoch, the helm is hard a a starboard, the Titanic struck the ice. The impact, while not violent enough to disturb the passengers or crew or to attest to the ship's progress, rolled the vessel slightly and tore the steel plating above the turn of the bilge. first damage reported. The testimony shows that coincident with the collision air was heard whistling or hissing from the overflow pipe to the four-peak tank, indicating the escape of air from that tank because of the inrush of water. Particularly at once the four-peak tank number one hold, number two hold, and number three hold, and the forward boiler room filled with water the presence of which was immediately reported to the mail room in the racket court and the trunk room in number three hold, and also from the fireman's quarters in number one hold. Leading fireman Barrett saw the water rushing into the forward fire room from the tier about two feet above the stoke hold floor plates and about 20 feet below the water line, which tier extended two feet into the coal bunker at the forward end of the second fire room. The serious nature of the damage is realized. The reports received by the captain after various inspections of the ship must have acquainted him promptly with its serious condition, and when interrogated by President Ismay, he so expressed himself. It is believed also that this serious condition was promptly realized by the chief engineer and by the builder's representative, Mr. Andrews, none of whom survived. Flooding of the vessel. Under this added weight of water, the bow of the ship sank deeper and deeper into the water. And through the open hatch leading from the mail room and through the other openings, water promptly overflowed E deck, below which deck the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth transverse bulkheads ended, and thus flooded the compartments abaft number three hold. The watertight compartments. The Titanic was fitted with 15 transverse watertight bulkheads. Only one, the first bulkhead from forward, extended to the uppermost continuous deck C. Deck C bulkheads number 2s, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15 extended to the second continuous deck D. And bulkheads numbers 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8, and 9 extended only to the third continuous deck E. The openings through deck E were not designed for watertight closings, and the evidence shows that flooding over deck E contributed largely to the sinking of the vessel. The bulkheads above described divided the ship into 16 main watertight compartments, and the ship was so arranged that any two main compartments might be flooded in any way without involving the safety of the ship. As before stated, the testimony shows that the five extreme forward compartments were flooded practically immediately and under such circumstances by reason of the non-watertight character of the deck at which the transverse bulkheads ended, the supposedly watertight compartments were not watertight and the sinking of the vessel followed. Distress calls sent out. No general alarm was sounded, no whistle blown, and no systematic warning was given the passengers. 
Within 15 or 20 minutes, the captain visited the wireless room and instructed the operator to get assistance, sending out the distress call, CQD. Distress calls heard. This distress call was heard by the wireless station at Cape Race that evening at 10.25 p.m. New York time, together with the report that she had struck an iceberg, and at the same time, she was accidentally overheard by the Mount Temple, which ship was immediately turned around toward the Titanic. Within two or three minutes, a reply was received from the Frankfurt. Within 10 minutes, the wireless operator of the Carpathia unfortunately and largely by chance heard the Titanic's CQD call, which he reported at once to the bridge and to the captain. The Carpathia was immediately turned around and reported her latitude and longitude to the Titanic, together with the fact that she was steaming full speed toward the stricken ship. The Frankfurt, however, did not give her latitude or longitude, and after waiting 20 minutes asked the operator of the Titanic what is the matter. To this, the Titanic operator replied that he was a fool. In view of the fact that no position had been given by the Frankfurt and that her exact distance from the Titanic was unknown at that time, the answer of the operator of the Titanic was scarcely such as prudence would have dictated. Notwithstanding this, however, the Frankfurt was overheard by the Mount Temple to report, our captain will go for you. Communication was promptly established with the Olympic and the Baltic and the, and the Coronia, some 800 miles to the east, overheard the Titanic CQD call. The wireless messages of the Titanic were recorded in part by the Cape Ray Station and by the Mount Temple and in part by the Baltic. The Mount Temple's last heard of the Titanic after the accident at 11.47 p.m. New York time. The Baltic and the Carpathia launched, lost touch about the same time. The last message they received being engine room getting flooded. The Virginian last heard the Titanic signal at 1227 New York time and reported them blurred and ending abruptly. Vessels in Vicinity of Steamship Titanic At this time, the committee thinks it is advisable to invite attention to the reported positions of the vessels in the vicinity of the Titanic when her calls of distress were being sent out. The Californian of the Leland Line, westbound, was in latitude 42 degrees 05 north, longitude 50 degrees 07 west and was distant in a northerly direction of 19 and a half miles according to the captain's figures. The Mount Temple of the Canadian Pacific Railroad Line westbound was at latitude 41 degrees 25 north, longitude 51 degrees 14 west, and was about 40 miles to the westward of the Titanic. And on her return to the Titanic's position, passed an unknown schooner. The Carpathia of the Cunard Line eastbound was 58 miles away, and she steered a course north 52 degrees west to reach the Titanic. The Burma, in Russian ship, was 70 miles off at 12.25 a.m. on Monday, the 15th of April. The Frankfurt of the North German Lloyd Line eastbound was in latitude 39 degrees 47 north, longitude 52 degrees 10 west, 153 miles to the southwest. The Virginian at midnight was about 170 miles distant from the Titanic. The Baltic of the White Star Line eastbound was about 243 miles southeast of the Titanic's position at about 11 o'clock Sunday evening, New York time. The Olympic of the White Star Line eastbound at 1214 New York time was about 512 miles to the westward in latitude 40 degrees 22 north, longitude 61 degrees 18 west. Steamship light seen from Steamship Titanic. 
16 witnesses from the Titanic, including officers and experienced seamen and passengers of sound judgment, testified to seeing the light of a ship in a distance. And some of the lifeboats were directed to pull for that light, to leave the passengers and return to the side of the Titanic. The Titanic fired distress rockets and attempted to signal by electric lamp and Morse code to this vessel. At about the same time, the officers of the Californian admit seeing rockets in the general direction of the Titanic, and they say immediately displayed a powerful Morse lamp, which could be easily seen a distance of 10 miles. While several of the crew of the Californian testify that the side lights of the large vessel going at full speed were plainly visible from the lower deck of the Californian at 11.30 p.m. ship's time, just before the accident. There is no evidence that any rockets were fired by any vessel between the Titanic and the Californian, although every eye on the Titanic was searching the horizon for possible assistance. The Steamship Californian's Responsibility The committee is forced to the inevitable conclusion that the Californian, controlled by the same company, was nearer the Titanic than 19 miles reported by her captain and that her officers and crew saw the distress signals of the Titanic and failed to respond to them in accordance with the dictates of humanity, international usage, and the requirements of law. The only reply to the distress signals was a counter signal from a large white light, which was flashed for nearly two hours from the mass of the Californian. In our opinion, such conduct, whether a raising from indifference or gross carelessness, is most reprehensible and places upon the commander of the Californian a grave responsibility. The wireless operator of the Californian was not aroused until 3.30 a.m. New York time on the morning of the 15th, after considerable conversation between officers and members of the crew had taken place aboard ship regarding these distress signals or rockets and was directed by the chief officer to see if there was anything the matter as the ship had been firing rockets during the night. The inquiry thus set on foot immediately disclosed the fact that the Titanic had sunk. Had assistance been properly offered promptly offered or had the wireless operator of the California remained a few minutes longer at his post on Sunday evening, that ship might have had a proud distinction of rescuing the lives of the passengers and crew of the Titanic. When Captain Smith received the reports as to the water entering the ship, he promptly gave the order to clear away the lifeboats, and later, orders were given to put women and children into the boats. During this time, distress rockets were fired at frequent intervals. The lack of preparation was, at this time, most noticeable. There was no system adopted for loading the boats. There was great indecision as to the deck which boats would be loaded. There was wide diversity of opinion as to the number of crew necessary to man each boat. There was no direction whatsoever in the number of passengers to be carried by each boat, and no uniformity in loading them. On one side, only women and children were put into the boats, while on the other side, there were almost an equal portion of men and women put into the boats. The women and children being given the preference, the preferential treatment in all cases. The failure to utilize all lifeboats to their recognized capacity for safety unquestionably resulted in a needless sacrifice of several hundred lives which might otherwise have been saved. Capacity of lifeboats not utilized. The vessel was provided with lifeboats, as above stated, for 1,176 persons, but only 706 were saved. Only a few of the ship's lifeboats were fully loaded while others were a bit partially filled, some were loaded at the boat deck and some at a deck, and these were successfully lowered into the water. The 20th boat was washed overboard when the forward part of the ship was submerged, and in its overturned condition served as a life raft for about 30 people, including second officer Light Taller, wireless operators Bride and Phillips, the latter dying before rescue, passengers Colonel Gracie and Mr. Jack Thayer and others of the ship who climbed upon it from the water 
at about the time the ship disappeared. The lifeboat devices. Had the sea been rough, it is questionable whether any of the lifeboats of the Titanic would have reached the water without being damaged or destroyed. The point of suspension of Titanic's boats was about 70 feet above sea level. Had the ship been rolling heavy and lifeboats as they were lowered would have swung out from side of the ship and rolled back tow it in on them. The return roll would have swung back and crashed against its side. It is evident from the testimony that the list of the Titanic became noticeable. The lifeboats scraped against the high side they were being lowered. Every effort should be made to improve lifeboat handling devices and to improve the control of boats while being lowered. Conflict of lifeboat reports. In the reports of the survivors, there are marked differences of opinion as to the number carried by each lifeboat. In lifeboat number one, for instance, one survivor reports 10 in all. The seaman in charge reports seven of the crew and 14 to 20 passengers. The officer who loaded this boat estimated that from three to five women and 22 men were aboard. Accepting the minimum report as made by one survivor in every boat, the total far exceeds the actual number picked up by the Carpathia. No distinction between passengers. The testimony is definite that except in isolated instances, there was no panic. In loading the boats, no distinction was made between first, second, and third class passengers. Although the proportion of lost is largest among third class passengers in either of the other classes. Women and children without discrimination were given preference. Your committee believes that under proper discipline, the survivors could have been concentrated into fewer boats after reaching the water, and we think that it would have been possible to have saved many lives had those in charge of the boats thus released to return promptly to the scene of the disaster. The conduct on lifeboats. After lowering, several of the boats rowed many hours in the direction of the light supposed to have been on display by the Californian. Other boats lay on their oars in the vicinity of the sinking ship, a few survivors being rescued from the water. After distributing his passengers among the four other boats which he had herded together, and after the cries of distress had died away, 5th Officer Lowe in boat number 14 went to the scene of the wreck and rescued four living passengers from the water, one of whom afterwards had died in a lifeboat. Officer Lowe then set sail in boat number 14, took in tow one collapsible boat and proceeded to the rescue of passengers on another collapsible lifeboat. The men who had taken refuge in the overturned collapsible lifeboat were rescued, including 2nd Officer Light Tower and passengers Gracie and Thayer, and wireless operator Bride and Phillips. By lifeboats number 4 and number 12, before the arrival of Carpathia, the fourth collapsible lifeboat was rowed to the side of the Carpathia and contained 28 women and children, mostly third-class passengers. Three firemen, one steward, four Filipinos, President Ismay and Mr. Carter of Philadelphia, and was in charge of the quartermaster's row. The ship went down gradually by the bow, assuming an almost perpendicular position just before sinking at 12.47 a.m. New York time on April 15th. There have been many conflicting statements as to whether the ship broke in two, but the preponderance of evidence is to the effect that she assumed an almost end-on position and sank intact. The committee deems it sufficient importance to call attention to the fact that the ship disappeared under the water and there was no apparent suction or unusual disturbance of the surface, surface of the water. Testimony is abundant that while she was going down, there was not sufficient suction to be manifest in any way of the witnesses who were in the water or in an overturned collapsible boat or on the floating debris or to the occupants of the lifeboats in the vicinity of the vessel or to prevent those in the water, whether equipped with life belts 
or not from easily swimming away from the ship's side while she was sinking. Captain Rostron The committee invites your attention to the course followed by Captain Rostron, commanding the Carpathia. Immediately upon the receipt of the wireless call of distress, Captain Rostron gave the order to turn the ship around and set a definite course towards the Titanic and instructed the chief engineer to call another watch of strokers, make them all possible, make the best speed to the ship. Realizing the possible presence of ice because of the collision, Captain Rostron doubled his lookouts and exerted extra vigilance, putting an extra lookout on duty forward and having another officer on the bridge. The captain immediately instructed the first officer to prepare all our lifeboats and have them all ready. The committee deems the course followed by Captain Rostron of the Carpathia as deserving of the highest praise and worthy of special recognition. Captain Rostron fully realized all the risk involved. He doubled his lookouts, doubled his fire room force, and notwithstanding such risk, pushed his ship to the very highest limit of speed through the many dangers of the night to the relief of the stricken vessel. His detailed instructions issued in anticipation of the rescue of the Titanic are a marvel of systematic pre pre preparation and completeness. The scene of the wreck. The first boat was picked up at 4.10 a.m. Monday, the last of the survivors was on board by 8.30 a.m., after which Captain Rostrum made arrangements to hold service, a short prayer of thankfulness for those rescued, and a short burial service for those who were lost. Bodies not visible. The committee directs attention to the fact that Captain Rostron of the Carpathia, although four hours in the vicinity of the accident, saw only one body, and that the Captain Lord of the Californian, who remained three hours in the vicinity of the wreckage, saw none. The failure of the Captain of the Carpathia, the Captain of the Californian, and the Captain of the Mount Temple of fine bodies floating in that vicinity in the early morning of the day following can only be accounted for in a theory that those who went down with the ship either did not rise to the surface or were carried away hidden by extensive ice flow, which during the night came down over the spot where the ship disappeared. While those bodies which have been found remote from the place where the ship went down were probably carried away by the scene, by the currents, or by the movements of the ice. <laughs>